afterwards will, there we go. But the discussion time afterwards will not be recorded. Uh, if that's okay with everybody, uh, just so that we still have that sort of open discussion and no one's afraid of saying anything mad that ends up on a re recording for all eternity. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I will hand over to Jeffrey uh, to present his topic for discussion and let you share your screen if you're able to. Jeffrey, uh, go for it. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, a little bit about my academic background. Um, I um, got my bachelor's degree in art history and visual culture from the University of California, Santa Cruz in 2013. Uh, then I came here to Cardiff in Wales and did my master's and my PhD in ethnomusicology. Uh, I finished that program in 2019. My um, PhD thesis was originally going to be about um, an Albanian type of uh, long neck lute called the Chifteli. I was going to do kind of a um, social survey and history of the instrument. And while researching the history, I decided to go back to the very origins of lutes themselves, uh, which turned out to be in ancient Mesopotamia around the beginning of the Akkadian period, uh, so around 2340 BC or so. And then I, I wound up getting so interested in that, in the first few millennia of the lute's history, that after I finished my thesis, I started getting more and more into music archaeology. And so now here I am. Um, so this talk is about a collaborative project that I've been working on since the spring with my friend and colleague, um, Sepide Haksa, uh, um, who was kind enough to give me access to a huge catalog of photos and um, measurements and data that she painstakingly collected of several hundred of these terracotta figurines from the ancient uh, kingdom of Elam which was located in southwestern Iran, uh, had its capital city at a place called Susa. And many of these figures show what is somewhat controversially called um, dwarf lutinists. And I'll be showing you some examples of these um, in a while. And so I, I took her photographs and her data and I, um, recorded measurements, I came up with um, a flexible scale of proportions and dimensions of these instruments as depicted in these figurines. And then I kind of averaged them all out just to get a sense of what the ratios and proportions of the different parts of these instruments were relative to the figures playing them. And then I created um, a prototype. This is a prototype, not yet the finished project, of the instruments that look something like this. So as my prototype, it has, it has a few flaws. There are a couple of fairly minor errors that I made, um, which will be changed in future editions. But this is the instrument as it stands right now. And I'll be showing you more of that. And perhaps at the end, I can give you a little demonstration uh, so you can hear what it sounds like. Um, so for now, um, I'm going to talk about the, some of the issues that I had when trying to do this, this project and make this reconstruction. Because uh, usually when we're trying to do a historical reconstruction of an instrument, especially something this ancient that has been basically extinct for thousands of years, uh, we have three primary data sources. Uh, there are iconographic depictions of the instrument. Uh, there are textual mentions and descriptions. And then there are physical artifacts that have been excavated. So there are some types of these instruments that we actually have 
um, excavated artifacts from. And I'll show you a little bit of these. Uh, if I can get the screen sharing on. Okay. So this is a really good time in history to be working on historical reconstructions like this. Um, thanks sorry, to... sorry, Jeffrey, we, we can't yep. see your screen if you're sharing it. Are, are uh, you, have you shared your screen? Sorry uh, for the interruption. Um, maybe I need to bring the slides to this window. May, maybe, I don't know if you're sharing the, the, the window or the screen, it depends. Um, ah, I see the problem. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Give me one second here. Oh, oh, oh yes, perfect. Yes. Okay, uh, great. Yeah, if you're able to play it, there we go. Sorry. Uh, that's good. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good. So a lot of historical reconstructions of instruments are um, have attained a certain um, status in popular culture these days and have expanded way outside of academia. Uh, a lot of this has to do with musicians like um, this man, Einar Selvik, who I believe is from Norway. And he is in a neo-folk band called Vardruna. And he did the, um, he composed all the, the soundtrack and the incidental music for the popular TV show Viking, which was so popular that it kindled a huge wave of interest in um, early medieval Germanic style lyres. And we have a number of different types of these from archeological finds. Um, he's shown here playing um, a Kravik style Germanic lyre. And this in turn has, because the lyre is now um, undergoing a revival to the point where it's becoming a living folk instrument again. And some of this has spilled over into into ancient lyres of the Near East and of Egypt. And a lot of it is centered on reproductions of things like the, um, the Sumerian silver lyre, which was one of the instruments found by Leonard Woolley in the 1920s in the Royal Tombs of Ur. And this has actually seen enough of a revival of interest that has, it has been featured in recordings um, like that, that done one called The Flood by a British singer named Steph Connor and um, the Lyre Ensemble that plays a replica of this. And she sings a number of songs um, from ancient Mesopotamian poems and proverbs, some of them in the original languages. So these these kinds of things are really helped by the fact that we have these archeological finds. So we can see more or less how the instruments were actually made. Um, Egyptian style lutes from the New Kingdom period have also been found. And so there's quite a few people who are working on those. But when it comes to the Mesopotamian lutes, we have nothing. So it's kind of a big void. All we have is a few Text, textual mentions of scattered names, and we have a good amount of iconography, but the problem with the iconography is that most of it is so non-detailed, often to the point of being almost abstract representation. So they show us basically what the instruments look like, but all the details of their construction are not there. So there's a lot of guesswork involved. And this type of guesswork is the main theme of, of this talk, uh, because in order to deal with this, I had to come up with a methodology that would allow me to create a historically credible um, reconstruction of these loops. Uh, so I'll talk briefly about the apparent origins and a very brief survey of the early history of lute instruments in the Near East uh, through the second millennium. Uh, the first depictions of these instruments that we have are uh, from the Akkadian period on these two cylinder seals um, kept at the British Museum. 
And so the Akkadians had just come to power in Mesopotamia at this time. They had taken over from the Sumerians. And so it's as if the Akkadians had just entered into the, um, into the power game of, of rulership over you know, empires and kingdoms. And so they took over these two um, image genres from the Sumerians of the presentation scene here and the banquet scene, but they did so by translating them into Akkadian artistic terms. These are the forms of these compositions are very different than the way the Sumerians did them. But where the Sumerians in a banquet scene would typically show at least one musician playing a harp or a lyre, the Akkadians um, did away with that. And at least on these two seals, they inserted uh, lute players. You can see this one here and this one here. So it's, it seems that the, the lute was an instrument of the Akkadians who were a West Semitic people, uh, as opposed to the Sumerians who were a very distinct uh, group of other people. Um, and I, I reason that we can presuppose a prehistory of lute among the Akkadians of maybe about 100 years or so. Um, and the reason I think this is that just because this is the first time we see lute depicted, it does not mean that this was the time when they were invented. Uh, it means that this is the time when the lutes had acquired a status within Akkadian culture that they were considered important enough to be shown in images like these cylinder seals that were basically kind of administrative um, images that were used to roll over damp clay and then put on um, packages of, and bundles, kind of like a receipt. So after these two seal impressions, we don't have any more depictions of lute until the old Babylonian period, about three or 400 years later, around 1900, 1800 BC. Uh, we do have some textual mentions, um, which is mostly a lot of names, but the nature of the names kind of informs us that the lutes had started to spread around the region. And then by the time we have iconography of the instruments again, we can see that it is spread far outside of just the region of Akkad here. Um, there are depictions of lutes from Mari and Ebla up here in North Mesopotamia and Syria. There are um, textual mentions of a lute of Marhashi, which is the Iranian plateau. Uh, later in the millennium, there's even a mention of a loot of what we now call Magiana, which is the region around Bactria up here in modern day Khorasan and Turkmenistan. And then we have a whole lot of images from Elam. Uh, oh, and we also know that there were loots being played in the kingdom of Dilmun down here. So by 1600, lutes have reached Elam. They're also being played in the old Hittite empire in Anatolia. And by about 1550, they start to appear in Egypt in the New Kingdom period. So there's clearly a diversity of forms and we can tell this from the diversity of names. Um, but we're not able to match up any of these names to particular lute types or genera that we see in, in artwork. Um, so there are also, let's see, but there are also certain types of lutes that seem to be particular to um, social function and social roles that are not necessarily um, regionally centered. Uh, for example, this figure in the center here is also from Elam, 
but he's of a very different type than the dwarf lutenist that I'm about to introduce you to. And the instrument that he plays is also very different. It has a shorter neck than what we see on things like the, um, the lutes from Mari and Ebla and the lutes that we see from the Hittite kingdom. It also has a somewhat bigger, rounder body. <clears throat> and this is in contrast to what we see in these dwarf figurines. So Sepeda has collected all these photographs of all these figures, and she's um, categorized them in a number of different um, image classes based on differences and similarities in some of the details of how they're composed. So I've taken a few samples from each of these categories. Um, because they're all a little bit different and they show different details of the instruments. And out of these, I tried to compile a sort of um, overarching, almost generic type. And I'll go through a few of these images and show you, point out some of the differences. So on this one, this is a very sparing um, illustration of the instrument. It just shows the long, somewhat narrow neck and the small round body. Um, it shows you that they're playing it with a plectrum and that's about it. It doesn't give us any more information than that. Um, this type, however, shows us a little bit more it indicates that there are two strings and they're shown by this groove cut down the middle of the neck. Um, and then down here, it bifurcates. So you can see the two ends of the strings where they are apparently um, tied on to the end of, of the neck as it extends into the body and underneath the, um, the hide covering of the soundboard. So that's something. It shows us that there are two strings on this instrument. Although not every one of these figurines clearly shows two strings, some of them just show us the neck. Like we have this one, that no indication of strings. We just have to assume that it has two. Um, but it does show that, where's my cursor, that the neck extends um, into the, the, the hide covering of the soundboard and through the body. So that shows us that it's what's called a spike construction. And that's common on these, but not, not universal on all of them. Um, then there are other examples like this one that doesn't really show us any details of the body. Um, it does have this interesting feature of these lines cut across um, the fingerboard of the neck. And Seppi and I have talked about this a lot, about what they could represent. Um, there are some researchers who believe that it could indicate fret. Um, I tend to disagree, um, mostly because there are only a few of these figures that have these lines. Um, this one over here has some that you can slightly see, but they're very different. On here, they're a bit more diagonal, which doesn't make sense for fret. And on others that have them, they're not, they're not arranged consistently with each other, which if they are frets would indicate that they use a variety of different tuning systems, which to my mind doesn't exactly make sense. Um, because we would think that these musicians are all using some kind of common musical system. So why would they have 
such radically different arrangements of threat is, is the question that, that I think we need to contend with. Uh, we did come up with the theory that perhaps they indicate kind of tonal ranges on the fingerboard where the musicians could use them as markers to place their fingers to find um, like a, a spectrum of pitches for particular notes in the scale. Um, when I designed the reconstruction, I did take these into account and let's see, let me pull out of screen sharing for a second. Okay, so on this, I took the measurements of those lines that you saw in that figurine, and I tried to compute whereabouts on the neck where the, that they were. I tried to match them up to possible um, pitches and intervals, and found that there was, there was a slight correlation with certain intervals, but I really kind of had to, had to fudge it a lot and shuffle things around. Um, so I didn't feel that it was, it was a very accurate kind of measurement. Um, but I did think that perhaps they were ornamentational bands. So that is what these are. And in the end, they're, they're a little bit useful um, as, as interval markers. There is, this interval here, which gives a perfect fifth, which is a, a consonant interval. It's a very important interval in tuning systems. And the perfect fifth is just a little bit past this band here. Um, then there's the octave of the lower string here, which is just before this marker. Um, but other than that, there's not much correspondence. Um, but I thought they do make nice ornamentation. So there's that. Uh, okay. Oh, and here's some other figurines. I'll just go through these. Uh, these two are important because they show us what appears to be the bridge of the instrument. And this is an important feature. Um, so the bridge seems to be uh, this large kind of horizontal fan-shaped structure that's um, that we definitely know was present on ancient Egyptian roots. And I'll get to those in just a second. So that's a little bit of further information. Uh, on my reconstruction, I didn't get to make this kind of bridge because of some slight miscalculations in how I connected the, the neck into the, the soundboard. But um, future iterations, I'm going to try for that. Okay. So one of the things that, um, that I gleaned from all of these different, the variety shown in these images is that we are probably dealing with a, a genus of lute instruments rather than um, sp a specific type. That there's probably like a group of instruments that are all very closely related, but they show a fair amount of individual variety. And so that is how I justify um, the deviations that I included in my prototype. And that this is present in other types of lute instruments um, is shown by 
this type of Egyptian um, Coptic lute from the first few centuries of the Common Era. Um, and there are seven extant examples that um, have been discovered by these. And Professor Ricardo Eichmann has done a very excellent job of, of describing these. And we can see that they are all very clearly related to each other. They're all of a particular type or genera. And yet every one is also clearly individual, um, which suggests that um, there are many different traditions of how to make a specific type of instrument and that they can all be considered authentic or legitimate uh, versions of it. So now I'll talk about um, the three models that I used and show you how they're constructed and how I use them to come up with the design for this ancient Near Eastern lute. So first we have the ancient Egyptian lute and we have a number of, of different examples of these. There were two types of lute played in New Kingdom Egypt. There is this type one that has a smallish rounded body. Uh, they were often made of tortoise shells, but also of wood. And then it has this long slender neck. These usually have two strings on them. And then there is type two, which is a, a somewhat larger one. And it has a more um, narrower, but oblong shaped body. And again, this longish narrow neck. Um, in these paintings, there is sometimes these lines painted across the fingerboards that we think indicate fret. And some of the um, archaeological finds do seem to have traces of, of fret. So this is the, the oldest Egyptian lute that we've discovered. Uh, it's from the tomb of the singer Harmos, Harmosa, who was a singer for an architect to Queen Hatshepsut. And Harmosa died around 1490 BC. And so we see here very clearly the construction of it. It has, the, the neck is round, so the fingerboard is curved. Uh, it has the tuning rings up here with the strings knotted in the ends. And then it has this distinctive um, weaving technique by which the neck is inserted through the, the hide of the soundboard and there are slits cut in the hide. And so the neck is woven between those slits. Uh, in this case, the, the spike of the neck goes all the way to the end of the body and it rests on the back rim. Uh, this here is the bridge and you can see it in profile here. And it's a horizontal fan shaped bridge. And it's got an, an underlapping joint to where the end of the bridge curves around and just fixes on to the back of the, of the spike. And it's held in place that way and the strings pass over the top. So the lute was, was introduced to Egypt from um, parts north, from Canaan, from uh, Syria, from Mesopotamia. So I, I feel that it's, it's pretty reasonable to think that because it was an imported instrument and one of the main ways it came into Egypt was through diplomatic channels, through royal exchanges of musicians and court orchestras, um, so there was probably a fair amount of conservatism in the design of these instruments. But at the same time, as the instruments became naturalized into Egyptian culture, the Egyptians probably also introduced some changes to the design to kind of make it um, a more 
purely Egyptian thing, but out of respect for its origins and its, you know, its royal status, um, there are probably a lot of features that remain the same. So my second model is a more modern instrument. And by modern, I mean within the last uh, 1,000, 1,500 years. And it's a type of lute played in the Sahel region of um, Western Africa. And that is this region. There's a number of different species of them uh, with different names, depending on which country or which um, ethno-linguistic group plays them. Uh, they're mostly concentrated from Mauritania, Senegal, and into Niger and Mali. There's also a type played in Morocco and by the Tuareg in the Sahara Desert. And these look like this. <clears throat> uh, this is a type called a kalam. Uh, they're sometimes also called ngoni. And my reasoning for choosing this type of instrument as another model is because while I don't think that we can prove currently um, direct historical transmission of these instruments from Egypt into West Africa, I think there's a certain um, confluence of specific design features that this um, shares with the Egyptian loops of the type two type that in my experience are not really found anywhere else. And so that could just be chalked up to coincidence, but I think it's reasonable to assume that there was some kind of, of transmission of these features. Um, it's also hard to prove because the Egyptian loot that I was talking about um, kind of disappear from the historical record by around 500 BC. And the first notice we have of any kind of loot being played in Western Africa comes from um, Arab travelers and writers in the Middle Ages around the 10th to 13th century. So that's a very big gap during which time we have no idea where these types of loops went. Uh, we don't know if they still existed or if maybe this was a revival, but yeah. So the basic design of these is you have this kind of narrow oblong body like the Egyptian type two loops. Uh, it's hollowed inside. It's covered with goat skin like the Egyptian loop. The neck is round, so the fingerboard is curved. You have these two strings here, which are um, stopped strings. So you stop them with your fingers. Like that. Um, where this deviates from the Egyptian loop is that over, the, over time, um, different groups of people in West Africa have added more strings along the side that are not stopped with the fingers, but they're played just open, um, almost in the manner of a harp or a lyre. And in order to attach those strings, because these instruments use the leather tuning rings, they added the tuning rings to these strings down here, which means that suddenly, the height of these strings from the fingerboard has to be raised so that when you're fretting them, they don't hit against these rings. And um, because then these rings will act as like accidental frets and they don't want that. So they had to raise the angle of these two strings, which they did by changing the horizontal fan bridge to a vertical type of fan bridge that instead of the underlapping joint um, fits onto the end of the spike like a, like a ring on a finger and the strings pass over it, the tension of the strings pulls this slightly forward, but because this is very high, it gives these strings the height needed so that they clear these tuning rings. 
um, which I think is a very clever and elegant design. And so one of the things I learned from using these as a model was how one change in a design, like adding extra strings, suddenly makes it necessary to create these other changes in design, like the shape of the bridge. But if you don't have these, then nothing needs to change, so obviously. So I kind of felt like the similarities to th between this and the Egyptian type two loops were close enough that, that this served as a good living model. And my third model is another modern uh, type of loop that's played in um, Morocco, parts of Mauritania, um, Algeria and Tunisia, by um, mostly by by the Berber people, the Amazigh, uh, called a gunbri, or sometimes a lotar. And these look roughly like this. Uh, these tend to resemble the Egyptian type one loop. Uh, this is a little bit atypical because it uses a gourd for a body instead of tortoise shell or wood, but they very often do use tortoise shells and wood for the body. So they have smaller rounded bodies. They have the same um, round neck with a curved fingerboard. Um, they have the same goat hide um, soundboard. Uh, they have the same kind of spike construction. In this case, the full spike that comes all the way up to the end here. Um, but these have shown um, a bit of what I call a morphological drift in that they've change two features that are more recent, um, maybe about 1500, 2000 years ago is when these wooden tuning pegs started to become used on the instruments. And they have what's called a floating bridge instead of the fan type bridges. And the floating bridge is just a bridge like this that just sits on the soundboard. You can adjust it um, as you will. But yeah, so these I thought were a good model as well. Excuse me a second. And again, it's it's difficult to prove a direct historical connection between the Egyptian lutes and these types of, of North African instruments. But I feel pretty strongly that, that there was um, a direct transmission. Uh, we know that other um, lute instruments and other musical instruments in general did pass from Egypt along the North African coast. Uh, in some cases, probably even traveled with um, Phoenician colonists as they established colonies further and further west. Um, like the Coptic lutes, uh, the drawings of which I showed you a little while ago, there are images of those from um, much further west in North Africa. Like there's a mosaic um, image from a, I think a sixth century church in uh, Qasr al-Labiya um, during the Vandal Kingdom in um, what's now Tunisia that shows something very similar to the Coptic lutes being played in an, an image of what is believed to be um, King David as the shepherd. And those types of instruments continue traveling west and eventually the Arabs brought them into um, the Iberian Peninsula. And some of them even became ancestors of, of um, medieval and Renaissance era European instruments. So it's, it's clear that there were musical instruments traveling westward along the coast. So I think it's a reasonable assumption that these ancient Egyptian lutes did the same thing and that these Moroccan instruments could well be descendants 
of the Egyptian ones. And so by extension, they might have retained features of the Mesopotamian and Elamite instruments that we see in the dwarf figurines. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about um, a few of the difficulties that I faced and the, um, the decisions I had to make uh, when designing this instrument. That the images that I was working with are not that clear about. And that's what I use these models to help me try to decide. Uh, there was the problem of how far does the neck, the spike of the neck, extend through the soundboard? Does it go all the way through and rest on the back rim? Or does it end here and use these notches to connect the strings to? Um, on this prototype, I decided to go for this kind of construction, um, which unfortunately, due to the, the small size of the resonator, I wound up not being able to make the horizontal fan type of bridge because I didn't have enough space for the underlapping joints. So I decided to go with a free floating bridge, which is not entirely accurate, but there it is. And on future editions, I'm going to um, adjust my plans accordingly. Um, there is also the width of the neck. I had originally planned to make this a bit um, thicker, but I made an error when I was um, planing this down um, where it was a little too short in the middle. And so then I had to make the whole thing narrower. And it's a little bit narrow, but it still works. Uh, again, in future editions, I'm going to make this about a half to three quarters of a centimeter wider. and that will give the fingers more room to maneuver up here. Um, the shoulders were another uh, questionable area. I uh, couldn't tell if they rest right on the rim, like on the Egyptian loops and the um, West African, or if they are mortised or notched into the, the rim itself. Um, also, the shape of the resonator was an issue because the images show us nothing of what the back of the instrument looked like. So all I had to do was guess, but because the dwarf figurines are always shown holding them like this, like resting in the crook of their arm, I reasoned that it had to have some depth to it. And um, to support my case for that, I used this um, Central Asian instrument, the Kashgar Rabab. And it too is always played in the crook of the arm like this. And so it's always made with a fairly deep, very bowl shaped body um, that allows the musician to do that. And then like on the Elamite figurines, the plucking hand is way out here um, instead of back here, like it would be if you were just holding it in your lap. And the only other issue was the material of the strings. Uh, we know that in the Near East, they used gut strings, um, but we don't know exactly how they were made. On instruments like the West and North African instruments, when they use gut strings, they're a very, um, how to say, they, they're made in such a way that they often include things like blood veins that are still in the, um, it's made from the intestinal lining and there will still be blood veins and things like that in the strings, which gives them a particular timbre. Uh, when gut strings are made for European um, early music instruments, they use a, I don't wanna say sophisticated or refined um, because it's not necessarily better. It's just a different, um, type of tonal aesthetic that they're going for. But they're just made in a very different way. Um, but 
so far I've, I've not been able to get my hands on the type of strings they would use for the North African instruments. So I did go with some um, early music gut strings. Uh, in the future, I'm going to try to find uh, something like the North African string. And yeah, so that's, that's how I came up with this. And um, this instrument came out sounding kind of like this. Yeah, so that's that's all I have to say on the matter. Um, thank you for listening. Um, anyone have any questions? Oh, that was 